Good morning, welcome. If we haven't met, my name is Christine and I am the executive pastor here at Lifeway Church. Thank you. I'm gonna ask you all to say a little prayer for my tablet this morning. It just froze a few seconds ago, so we're good now. We're good. <laughs> um, but I wanna thank you guys for joining us this morning as we were finishing up our series called Once Upon a Marriage. We've been taking some Old Testament couples and we've been letting their marriages speak into our lives today. But before we begin, I want to take a minute to thank the ministry of uh, Life Church Network. They have so graciously provided all of these resources, the cute videos that we see. They provide it for free, so it's a huge blessing. Um, today, we're going to be looking at a man named Abram and a woman named Sarai. So we're going to be spending quite a bit of time in Genesis this morning. Now, sometimes I look back and I think about how different my life has turned out. When I was younger, before I was married, I spent a lot of time thinking about what my timeline, my life timeline would be. I spent a lot of time thinking about how my life story would be scripted. And now I imagine some of you have probably done the same thing. Or maybe you have, you're one of those people with a 5, 10, 15, 20 year plan, right? Do I see some head nods? <laughs> but for me, marriage wasn't something that I wanted to enter into, into until I was done with college well established in my career because I wanted to do things, right? I wanted to travel. I also decided that I wanted to live in the city. I had this goal to live in Manhattan. And then when I eventually would get married, when I eventually did get married, I did plan on how many kids I would have. I, I, I would have one girl and two boys, you know, like a menu selection. I'll take one girl, two boys in that order. And the girl would be named Abigail. I had it all planned out. And I also planned that once I was married that we would not struggle we would be comfortable. <laughs> I planned that we would be happy, we would be healthy, and my husband and I, we would be madly in love until the day that we died. The end. <laughs> well, I, don't know about, I don't know about you, but my actual life story looks nothing like I had thought it would, right? Nothing. In fact, I don't think that if my life story was a book, right, my younger self would not have been able to pick it up out of a lineup, right? The cover is different. The pages are all different. The characters are even different. I mean, I'm still there, but I'm different, right? Now, don't get me wrong, I love what God has done with my life. I love my life story. But my actual life story, in my actual life story, I actually didn't, um, I, I didn't wait until after college to get married. You see, in complete transparency, I'm gonna be transparent with you guys today, is that okay? Okay, in complete transparency, I dropped out of school early because I was pregnant, so I ended up married at 21, pregnant, and I didn't go back to finish nursing school until my third child was six weeks old. And I didn't have one girl and two boys. I had one girl, four boys, and I can promise you nobody's named Abigail. <laughs> and my first was actually a boy, not a girl. And we were far from comfortable. In fact, we were probably what you would consider dirt poor. We really struggled. So living in the city was not an option. Plus, can you imagine cramming five kids in a flat in New York City? <laughs> but now I look into my, I fast forward 25 years into my marriage, and also happy and healthy and madly in love are probably not the words that I would use to describe our marriage on a daily basis. In fact, again, to be transparent, there are days that we look at each other and say, how the heck are we going to do this? How are we even going to stay married? Right, married couples? Do you agree with me? <laughs> you understand? Maybe some of you look at your adult lives. Maybe your marriage is 5, 10, 25 years in, and you too are saying, this is not what I expected. This is nothing like I thought it would be. You know, I find it interesting how our expectations don't always line up with reality, right? Sometimes things are better. Sometimes things are worse. But they are rarely like we expected. So if you look at your life and you're thinking, this is much, much different than I had planned, and I suspect that's probably most of us, if not all of us here today, then I believe today's biblical couple, Abram and Sarai, will speak to your hearts in a very profound way this morning. We're going to start off in Genesis. We're going to go to chapter 12. We're going to start in verse 1. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land that I will show you. And God makes this incredible promise to Abram. He says in verse 2, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. 
I will bless those that you bless, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out for Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. So God basically tells Abram that you're going to have to go, and you're going to have to leave everything that makes you comfortable. You're going to leave your relatives, you're going to leave the land that you've known, and you're going to leave your home, and you're going to have to go into another place. God also tells Abram, you're going to have to follow me by faith, and then I will bless you. In fact, if you look in the New Testament, and we're going to look at Hebrews 11:8, Abram is characterized as being faithful. Here's what the Bible says. By faith, Abraham, so he will later be called Abraham. I'm talking about the same person here. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to, a, go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he didn't know where he was going. So by faith, Abram followed the voice of God. Now, I can only imagine the conversation between Abram and his wife Sarai that followed, right? God told you what? Man, you are 75 years old. Are you sure you heard right? Now, I have to tell you that this imagined conversation between Abram and Sarai resonates very deeply with me because, you see, it reminds me of the day that my husband Tim came to me. He was about 30, maybe a little bit, little bit older. He came to me and he said, Chris, I believe that God has called me to be a youth pastor, but first we have to go. And by go, it meant moving our whole family to Springfield, Missouri, which I've later named Misery, for Tim to go to seminary. <sighs> Now, again, he was in his 30s, but I lovingly looked into my husband's eyes, and I said, no, he didn't. He did not call you to be a pastor, because for you to be a pastor, that would make me, that would make me a pastor's wife, and he did not call me to be that. I have no interest, and I have no interest in, in moving. Plus, by the time you're done with seminary, you're going to be close to 40, and that's way too old to be a youth pastor. I think you should go back, pray, and get a better answer. And as sweet as my husband is, he did. He went back and he prayed. And, well, a year later, our whole family packed up and we moved to Springfield, Missouri. Missouri, you're going to have to help me. We moved to Springfield, Missouri a year later. And just, and so, and you guys know, actually, you guys know the end of that story, right? I mean, Pastor Tim is our family pastor here at Lifeway, which includes our youth. So God did call him, <laughs> which I guess technically makes me a pastor's wife. So... And just like Abram and Tim, God is going to speak to many of you in the same way. He's going to say, follow me by faith when I call you into the unknown. Now, maybe that's a new home, a new work environment, a new ministry. Or maybe he's called you to give and you've never given before. God will often call you into the life of blessing. And the only road there is through faith. Amen. <laughs> but chances are, you're going to be like me and you're going to say, God, I'm going to go. But before I go, I want some details, right? I'm going to want to know, where am I going? When am I going? How long am I going to go there? Why am I even there, right? God's not going to give us details, though. He rarely gives us details. And I think there's two reasons for this. Exactly. There's two reasons for this. They said amen, and it's for a reason. The first one is we can't handle the truth, right? We can't handle details, right? Because if God were to give us all of the details of what he's called us into, do you think any of us would obey? No, we wouldn't. And I have to be honest, if I had known all of the details associated with Springfield, Missouri, I probably would not have obeyed either. Now, the second thing, the second reason I believe that God doesn't give us details is because if he gives us all of the details, then it wouldn't take faith anymore, would it? It would now be a checklist. And doesn't the Bible tell us that without faith, it is impossible to please God? That's right. So, our big idea for today, and probably your first filling, is God does not give us a detailed plan. He gives us an opportunity to have faith in him. So God doesn't give us details, right? He gives us an opportunity to have faith in him. He gives us an opportunity to please him, which is what God gave Abram and Sarai. He gave them an opportunity to please him when he gave him this following promise. He said, you are going to be a great nation, which means you're going to have lots of kids, you're going to have lots of grandkids, you're going to be massively blessed with children and descendants, which if you're not familiar with this story, 
the Bible introduces Sarai as saying she is barren, right? She's born no children. And also, just a side note, she's 65 years old when Abram first receives the promise that they'll have descendants. So I imagine that this promise of children is probably something that may seem humanly impossible to Sarai and to Abram. I also imagine that this promise probably speaks to a deep, longing ache in Sarai's heart. So now God is promising them children, but first, they have to go, and well, they don't get very many details. Now, what's interesting to me about their story is that both Abram and Sarai are characterized as man and woman of faith. But if you look at their story, which we're going to do today, they weren't always faithful, right? Which encourages me because sometimes I waver in my faith, but I can still be characterized as a woman of faith. You can still be characterized as a man or a woman of faith. That's a little bit comforting, isn't it? Today we're going to look in, we're going to spend some time in the areas of Abram's and Sarai's life story where they both falter in their faith. Actually, they mess up in some pretty significant ways. But the good news is, is that even in the times where they were faithless, Right? God was always faithful, and the same is true for us today as we get to know the goodness and faithfulness of God. Now, does that mean we never have to have faith at all because God has enough faith for all of us? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. And you're going to see in their story today that you're going to see in their story that though that Abraham and Abram and Sarah had times of faithlessness, God didn't fulfill the promises that he, he didn't fulfill the blessings that he had promised until they had completely surrendered to the Lord until they, had, they were unwavering in their faith. But what typically happens when life doesn't go as planned is rather than being strengthened and steadfast in our faith, we begin to doubt, right? We begin to falter. Now, maybe that's not what we want to do, right? That's never our intention. But that's what can happen if we're not careful. So today, we're going to look at three things that can happen when life doesn't go as planned. And the first one is, we can fall victim to fear. So if you're following along in your notes, it should be your next filling. We fall victim to fear. And this is what happened to Abram as they entered Egypt. So we're going to read about that now. Genesis 12, we're going to go to verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they'll let you live. So during that time, when you entered enemy territory, if they liked the wife, they could kill the husband to get to the wife. So this was, Abr this was Abram's fear, right? That because of Sarai's beauty, the Egyptians would kill him. But this was also Abram's opportunity to place his faith in the Lord. After all, God did promise him he would be the father of nations, right? So let's see. Did he trust God? Let's read on to verse 13. Abram tells Sarai this in verse 13. He says, Say you are my sister, so that I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. So they chose to lie, right? Now, God had promised Abram that you're going to have kids, which I'm pretty sure, even in those days, still required one living man and one living woman, right? God gave him the end of the story. He said he was going to make him into a great nation, and that his name would be great, and that God would bless him, which I'm pretty sure means he's not going to die in that scenario. Have you guys ever watched a movie where you know that the character, the main character of the movie, you know that they're going to prevail in the end? It's like a superhero movie, right? My, those are my favorite. If you know me, you know I don't really watch a lot of TV or watch movies, but I love superhero movies. And I think the reason I like them so much is because there's so much comfort in knowing how it's going to end. I know that the superhero is going to win, right? I know he always wins. He or she always wins. I may not... I may know the end of the story, but I don't know all the details, right? I still have to ride the roller coaster with this character, right? We don't know the obstacles they're going to come up against. We don't know all of the details of their trials, but we know how it's going to end. And that was true for Abram. He was given the end of his story. He was told that he would have a victorious outcome by the Lord. But all of a sudden, he's afraid that he's going to die, which tells us at that moment, he was doubting the promises of God. And by fear, he made a sinful decision and he said, let's lie because I really don't trust God to do what he said he's going to do. Now, sometimes as believers, I think that we forget that trusting in God, that does not mean that we're never going to come up against problems. 
that doesn't mean that we're never going to experience obstacles. But we get so hung up on the what-ifs in life, we begin to fear. For example, we begin to live life in fear. For example, maybe God is calling us into the, maybe God's calling one of you into the, into the blessing of a godly marriage right now. But you're thinking, what if he or she cheats? What if we get divorced? What if we're financially strained? So then, rather than live a life of faith, we begin to make decisions in fear. Maybe God is calling us to tithe, but we've never given before. So we begin to question. We, we get scared. We say, God, what, what if I lose my job? What if we struggle? What if I can't pay my bills? So then we talk ourselves out of being obedient to God. And I believe that's what happened with Abram here. He panicked. God had already given him a promise of future generations that would come direct from Abram. However, the minute he hit an obstacle, he stopped believing in the promise and he gave in to fear. And the second thing that happens, the second thing that can happen, is we get ahead of God. When our life is not going as we expected or our life story does not, doesn't look like what we scripted, we sometimes get ahead of God. Now, I don't know if that's you, but I'm going to be really honest. This is me. This point right here speaks direct to my soul. God, you promised me kids, but I don't have them yet. God, you said I would be married, but I'm not married yet. God, you told me I would have this ministry, but I don't. So we begin to think God is taking way too long, and we begin to think that God's in need of our help, right? God needs our intervention. So then we stop cooperating with God, and we start to manipulate the situation. We decide we need to bring some action for ourselves. Well, that too is where Sarai went wrong, and we're going to read about that now. Genesis 16, uh, verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. Now, remember, God had promised Sarah and Abraham that, that they would have a child, but 10 years at this point has now passed. So this is now a problem for Sarai. Let's continue reading. But she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build my family through her. So Sarai basically has decided that God is taking way too long and figures that he's in need of her intervention. So she decides to manipulate the situation. She decides to force it. God promised me a son, so now I'm going to make it happen myself. Now Sarai gets a really bad rap here. And she should, because this is a terrible, miserable idea, right? But she's she's not the only one who messed up. You'll notice the last line of Genesis 16-2 says this. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. He didn't even have to be talked into it, Right? (laughs) And he's the one that the Lord appeared to now three times. And every time God reassured Abram that he would be the father of many. In fact, in chapter 15, so a chapter before this, um, Abram decides that God probably needs his help as well. And he suggests, he makes a suggestion to God. He says, well, how about my, my house servant? Maybe my house servant should be my heir. And God quickly rejects that. And he tells him, no, you are going to have a son. You, from you and Sarah, you will have a son. But notice, Abram doesn't say to Sarai, oh, Sarai, have faith in God. He can do this. God can bring about his promises. Nope. He says, sure, I'll sleep with Hagar. Let's take the situation into our own hands. And if you read through this whole story, it's a complete disaster. Hagar, the maidservant, she does have a son with Abram. His name is Ishmael, but there was no joy. There were no blessings. It's actually, it's like TLC sister wives level material. (laughs) There was jealousy, rage, fear, and a whole lot of unhappy people, and all because they tried to force something before it was God's will. Now, you may be sitting here and saying, that's a really extreme, a really extreme circumstance, right? How stupid. I would never do something like that. And maybe you didn't go out and get your husband a concubine, and maybe men, you didn't agree to it. But I can guarantee we've all thought, right? We've all thought, God needs my help. God needs my help. How many times have we asked God for some sort of a blessing? And I mean, it could be something that we truly, truly need, right? It could be a very valid request. We maybe need a car because ours ours is broken. We may need a bigger house because we can't fit all our kids in it, right? We may need new clothes because ours are tattered. We begin to look around us and see the blessings that everyone else has. And then instead of waiting, 
and managing our money wisely like God's word teaches us to, we decide that God needs our help, so we force it. We buy now, we pay later, right? We decide that our timing is best. We force the blessing only for that blessing to turn into the curse of debt that could take us years to pull ourselves out of. So let's be honest. How does that blessing feel today? Does it even feel like a blessing? Or does it feel like a four, five, six, several hundred dollar a month curse? And I don't know about you, but I think a blessing delivered by the power of the Holy Spirit is far beyond the blessings provided by the ordinary means of these two hands. Well, Sarah needed a reminder, too, because see, you see what she did is she took this God-sized problem and she tried to solve it with humanly possible solution, right? Accomplished through ordinary means. Because God wasn't delivering the blessing on her timeline. But here's what we have to remember. God is never late. This is so important. I want you to say it with me. God is never late. God's timing is perfect. God is always on time. He's never early. He's never late. And God is always, he's even on time, even without our intervention, isn't he? Yes. Ecclesiastes 3.1 says, There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. Skip down to 11, and it says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. Our God, the creator of master, and master of time and space, has his own timetable for everything under heaven. And he makes everything beautiful in his time. Now, I know it's hard not to lose faith when we feel like we've been waiting on God for so long. And maybe you're sitting here today, and, and you're single, and you've been praying for a spouse for 5, 10, 15, maybe even more years. Or maybe you've been waiting on God for a child. Or maybe you're waiting on God for, for a healing and you feel like you're in a race against time. Now, I don't know what you're going through or how long you've been waiting on God, but what I do know is this. I know that he hears you. I know that he loves you. And I know that he wants you to put your faith in him because he will make all things beautiful in his time. But what's not beautiful is the mess that's often left. It's almost always left when we try and force our agenda. We force our timetable, and we get ahead of God, and we start to make decisions in fear. The third thing that we can do is we don't believe that God will do it for us. So when life's not going as planned, we don't believe that God will do it for us. That's your next fill-in. We may be... We may buy the fact that he'll do it for others, right? We may believe that he'll answer prayers for others, heal others, bless other, others, but we simply don't believe that he's going to do it in our life. And quite honestly, I can see why Abram and Sarai would feel this way. Remember, Scripture says that Sarai was barren, and she bore no children. And again, she was 65 years old when God first appeared to Abram and promised that they would have children. And they believed, right, because they went. But then they waited, and they waited... And they waited. Five years goes by, no baby. Ten years go by. Fifteen years goes by. Twenty years go by. Sarah and Abram, they waited. In fact, the scripture that we're going to read in a minute places Abram at 99 years old. And if you can do the quick math right now, it's almost 25 years now that have passed since the time God had promised them children. So you almost can't blame them, right? It would be easy to lose, lose faith in that situation. And in Genesis 17, God comes to them again, and this time he comes with a very specific promise. Well, first he renames them both. So, you know, Abram, it will now be known as Abraham, and Sarai is now Sarah. But after he renames them, he gives them this very specific promise. He tells them that they're going to have a son, and he tells them it's coming soon. And this is what the Bible says. This is how they reacted. Genesis 17, 17 says, Abraham fell face down. He laughed and said to himself, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? In other words, God, I am an old man, and there's nothing coming forth from this body other than arthritis, right? He said, Maybe I believed you years ago, but I don't believe you anymore because it's humanly impossible. It's humanly impossible circumstances, which may have been God's point. Let's see how Sarah responded. Eight, uh, go to chapter 18, verse 12. She says, this says, So Sarah laughed to herself, and she thought, 
After I'm worn out and my master is old, I will now have this pleasure. So Sarah laughs too, just like Abraham, but she adds a little sarcasm in there, right? And God catches on to it. And he says in verse 13, he says, Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child now that I'm old? But the next thing that the Lord says I believe, is a turning point in both Abraham and Sarah's life. I believe this is the turning point at which they stop all of their doubt. They stop all of their unfaithfulness, and they stop all of their manipulation. It is a turning point, and I believe it should be a turning point in our lives, too. Verse 14 says, Is anything too hard for the Lord? Sarah and Abraham needed a reminder You and I, we need a reminder, right? We need a reminder that God has the power to accomplish all that he's promised. Jesus emphasized this in Matthew 19, 26. He says, with God, all things are possible. But do we always believe that? If we're being honest, do we always believe it? Mm -mm. I know there's many of you that are here today that have been waiting on a miracle. And I would say to you, do you really think there's anything too hard for the Lord? There's those of you who have been maybe waiting on a spouse. And I would say to you, is there anything that's too hard for the Lord? To those of you that are waiting on a financial miracle and maybe you're giving up on faith, I would say to you, do you really trust that God, do you really trust God to save your soul from the pit of hell, but you don't trust him to do a miracle in your life? Our God, he is the God of the impossible. He is the God of miracles. He is the God that can breathe life into a 90-year-old barren womb and bring forth generations out of humanly impossible circumstances. Don't you think he can do the same in your life? Listen, let God breathe life into your situation. Let him breathe life into your finances, your relationships, and let him breathe life into your marriage. And remember, nothing is too hard for our God. And finally, our call to action today. Invite God in and then let God be God. Invite God in and then let him be God. Invite God into the center of every circumstance. Invite him into every life event, into every relationship. Invite him into your marriage, but then let him take the lead. Let him be God. And when life doesn't go as, you, as you've planned, when your life story looks nothing like you have scripted, embrace God. Listen, you don't need all of the things. I don't need all of the things. We don't need all of the things that we want. We need him, and he alone, he is enough. And whenever your faith starts to falter, which it can so easily do, you hang on to him. The good news is, though, is even if you're here today and you're feeling faithless right now, Abraham and Sarah were faithless too. I've been faithless, but you can still be characterized as being faithful, just like Abraham and Sarah, even though they messed up over and over again. Romans 4, 19 through 21 says this. Without weakening in his face, excuse me, without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in the, fa- in the faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he promised. So even though Abraham was faithless so many times up to this point, at almost 100 years old, there's now a shift. When the prospect of an heir direct from his body, direct from Sarai's body, were beyond any human ability or ordinary means, Abraham, Abraham did not waver in his faith. He believed that God would do what he said he would do. Listen, we're going to find ourselves in life circumstances that seem absolutely impossible. You may be experiencing an impossible situation right now in your life. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe it's the things that are going on in the world today. seem pretty impossible. But Abraham and Sarah should encourage us that even when things seem impossible, you should not waver in your faith. Even when things seem bleak or hopeless, do not waver in your faith. But even if we do, even if we have times of faithlessness, the good news is is that God is still faithful. We may falter, right? We may struggle. But God, he never does. He is always, in all times, through all circumstances, God is always faithful. So why would we embrace anything else? Why would we put our faith in anyone or anything else? 
Embrace him. Invite him in. Let God be at the center of your life. Let him be your number one. Invite him into the center of your marriage and all of your relationships. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you are a faithful father. Even when we falter in our faith, I thank you that though we have times of faithlessness, you, Lord, are always faithful. Father, I ask that you would do a miraculous work in every life that may be faltering in their faith today, and I pray that you would do a work in every strained and hurting marriage. I ask that you would remind us that there is nothing that is too hard for the Lord. God, for those who have been waiting on a promise for so long and they're starting to give in to fear, God, I pray that you would remind them right now that you alone are enough. And we can place our whole faith in you. We can trust you with our whole life because you, Lord, you're enough. You're everything we could ever need. So today, Father, we invite you into the center of our lives. We invite you, we invite you into the center of our marriages and into our circumstances. And then we invite you, Lord, to take the lead. And as we continue in this atmosphere of prayer, with all heads continuing to be bowed, I just want to talk to those of you who may not know where you stand with God right now. You may be wondering, have I been a good enough person? Have I, am I really okay with God? Have I done too many bad things? And if this is you today, I really want you to pay attention. This is for you. In the Bible, Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness, which means Abraham's faith and his belief in God is what made him right with God, not the things that he did or the things that he could do. If you're wondering where you stand with God today, then chances are you may not be in good standing. If you're thinking that I have to be a better person, I have to be more religious, I have to try harder, I have to earn, I have to earn it through, with God, right? I have to, to do it myself. I have to tell you that you will not succeed. None of us can do that. I can't do that. None of us here can do that. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all fallen short. None of us can make that mark on our own. But thankfully, verse 24 goes on to say that, yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. Because God loves us so much, he sent his sinless son, Jesus, to become sin for us on the cross as the perfect sacrifice for the forgiveness of our sins. Jesus died and then he rose again. Now everyone, including you, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So today, I beg you, call upon the name of Jesus, and in faith, you will be saved. If this is you and you want to place your faith in Jesus today, then repeat this simple prayer with me now. Father in heaven, I know in my life I've not always followed you. I've often chose to go my own way. Lord, I know that I have sinned against you, and for that, I am truly sorry. I ask for your forgiveness. I believe that your son Jesus died on the cross for my sins, and I am thankful for his sacrifice. And now I'm ready to trust you as my Lord and to give you leadership in my life. I ask that you guide me so that I may follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen.